Hello, we are back with more in Cape Sociology. Today we'll be continuing our journey looking at education. My name is Georgia Crawford Williams. I'll be your lecturer. So let's get into it. You know, once it is that I get here, we have to do a recap of what we did before. Once it is that you start a new lesson, you always think of what you did before. We looked at family. You should know who gave us a definition of family, which is George Peter Murdoch. You should know the functions of the family, as explained by Murdoch, as theorized by persons like Parsons. You should know the different types of family. You should know about the nuclear family. You should know about the extended family. You should know about the matrifocal family. You should know other key terms like matriarchal and patriarchal. You should also know the feminist view of the family and the sources of the different types of family, right? So if it is that you had gone through the lesson properly, then you should actually have that knowledge down pat. We would have actually done our culture as well, which is a major topic for your first module. And now we are continuing continuing module two. Module two has family, it has education, it has religion, the major institutions. So without further ado, let's get into it. Today we're talking about education, which you all should do well at because you're all a part of the educational system right now. Once it is that you do a topic, you have to start with your definition. Now, education is defined for us by Harlambus and Holborn. Harlambus and Holborn say that education is one aspect of socialization. It includes the acquisition of knowledge and the learning of skills. Harlambus and Holborn, the persons who wrote sociology themes and perspectives, what is known as the Bible for sociology. Yeah? So you must know the definition, you must know who said it, and better, preferably, word for word, that you can look bright in the exam. Good. So that being said, let's get into the theories of education. So it's my time. I'm going to start with the functionalist view of education. Who is the big functionalist? Before I run into it, take a moment, think. Who is the big functionalist? We did this when we looked at the perspectives. Who is the big functionalist? All right, here we go. The big functionalist is Emile Durkheim. So let's continue. The functionalist view of education. We start with Emile Durkheim, and Durkheim says to us that the education system has three major functions. One, it facilitates social solidarity. Two, it exposes us to social rules. And three, it prepares us for the world of work. Now let's get into it. What does that mean, really? Let's start with the facilitation of social social solidarity, sorry. Now the term solidarity means unity. Once it is that you see the term solidarity, you know you're talking about the functionalists. And Emil Durkheim believes that if a society is to exist and be stable, it must have social solidarity. And the educational system as an important institution helps to facilitate social solidarity. How does it do that? He says the education system helps to facilitate social solidarity through the teaching of history and loyalty to one's country. He said no matter which school you go, once it is that you get into the educational system, it starts to explain to you, if you're Jamaican, that you are Jamaican and that you should be Jamaican and proud. And when you go to devotion, you stand up and you sing the entire anthem and you learn the national pledge and that sort of thing. And then start telling all of the famous Jamaicans and why it is good to be a Jamaican. He said that is very important. It is not just done by chance. It is done so that you can understand that you're a part of something bigger than yourself. Yeah? And so you too become proud to be Jamaican. And in doing so, it fosters social solidarity. It fosters unity because you feel close to the next Jamaican. And all of you know can see eye to eye because we're all Jamaicans. The same thing happens with the teaching of history. Via the teaching of history, once again, you see how you are connected to persons who you don't even know. And automatically, you feel united. And that is why when you watch show, you actually watch the black man. And if the black man get beat up, you're kind of half -ex. Because you as a black person, you feel connected to the next black person because of the shared history. That is why if you're watching television and you see a Jamaican doing something big, you feel proud. That's why when we watch Olympics, we decide that we left work and we sit down. And when you see and win, we feel like a we win too. Because we learn from school that the education system and that our society in general is a part of who we are. Yeah? So the educational system fosters social solidarity by exposing us to history and also teaching us loyalty to our country. The second thing that the education system does is that it exposes us to social rules. 
Now, according to Durkheim, the first time you really learn about rules, set rules and punishment is at school. He says not that home don't have rules and punishment, you know, but them actually apply it willy-nilly. It not set. So today your mother will cuss and you get punishment and tomorrow you do the same thing and you get no punishment because she's tired of you. It is not set. And sometimes when you're at home, the rules that apply don't really apply to everybody. Yeah, you know, the wash belly might get wet. You know, the boy might get wet. The girl might get wet. But he says when it is that you go to school now, automatically you get a rule book. And you understand that there are certain rules and each rule could have a particular punishment. Now that is important, you know, because when you get into society, you're exposed to rules again and you're expected to abide by them. This time the rules are the laws and with each law, if there is a breaking of the law, there is a set punishment. But that not frighten you because you're used to it from school. So in essence, it is preparing you for society by exposing you to social rules. Finally, he says that the education system prepares us for the world of work. He says it is school that equips you with the specialized knowledge necessary so that you can go in and be a functional part of the working world. And so if it is that you're going to a doctor, then it's school that teach you the chemistry, the bio, the physics that is necessary. All this specialized knowledge that is needed so that you can be a proper worker is school give us. Therefore, Emil Durkheim as a functionalist is of the view that the educational system is functional. Yeah, and he gives the three major functions. So if you have a question about the functionality of the educational system, one of the first persons you have to write about is Emil Durkheim and speak to his three major functions. Good? All right. We move on to Emil's protege, Talcott Parsons. Talcott Parsons is a fan of Durkheim. He follow him up and he read him work and many of his writings are based on Durkheim. Now, Talcott Parsons agrees that the education system is functional, but he makes his own points. He says, one, the education system is meritocratic. Two, the education system is functional. And three, the education system fosters social mobility. And I'm going to go through each of them. One, the education system is meritocratic. Now, meritocratic means fair. That's the first thing. Write it down. You're going to see the term meritocratic all the time. I want to know what it means. The term meritocratic means it is based on merit, meaning you're judged based on what you can do, your talents. So if the system is meritocratic, it means that the system is fair. Yes, that's what it means. Now, Talcott Parsons says, the system is meritocratic as it exposes everybody to universalistic standards. Now, what do we mean by that? Universalistic standards are standards that are applied to everybody, regardless of who you are. So whether you're rich, you're poor, you're pretty, you're ugly, your country, your town, whichever, everybody is exposed to the same standards in school, according to Talcott Parsons. Now, it is important to note that Talcott Parsons says when you're at home, you are exposed to particularistic standards where you're judged not based on what you can do, but you're judged based on who you are. Yeah. So at home, there's no universalistic standard. Certain people get certain special treatment. And that is why you're picking your yard always. I say, who are the favorite and who get this and who get that. When I was growing up, my mother had four girls and one boy. So, you know, so automatically my boy, my brother got the special treatment, you know, him special. That's what I always say. Yeah. There was a running joke in our family that if the house is burning down, my mother would run in and take him out first. And, you know, put him down and give him some water and brush him up. That's the rest of we are born up, you know. And she said, look, how oh, you're nearly dead. Oh, God. And hug him up. And then she run in and take out one more. And then she might take out a third one. And she said, all right, you're five, no bad. You know, if we have three, we're good. Yeah. But him, I feel all right. And that is because we are saying that the system at home is based on particularistic standards. But Parsons says, once you get into the educational system, it is judged on universalistic standards. It is judged, let me go back to it, on universalistic standards. And that is so very important for me. So let me go back to that. Right? Universalistic standards, clear. Now, it means that once you and I get into school, then we all have the same opportunity 
to be successful. That's what Parsons is saying. There is nothing hindering your success. Everybody work and you're judged based on your talent. So nobody don't give you no extra grade before because you're poor. Nobody don't give you no extra grade because you're rich. Everybody have to earn what it is that they want. And so according to Talcott Parsons, education is the great equalizer. Because no matter where you come from, no matter if you're a boy or girl, everybody has a chance to succeed. And as a consequence, Parsons believe that education is one of the most important institutions in society because it is operating on universalistic standards. It means, therefore, that a status is achieved. You have to earn it. Nobody not gain a grade just because you're pretty. You have to work for it. And he says, you know that because you all have the same teachers. You all take the same exams. You all have the same books. You all have to do the same work. So that shows you that the education system is meritocratic. I am laboring on this point because it is such a popular question in your exams. The meritocracy of the educational system and the functionality as a consequence is very important. There are many other theorists who are going to agree or disagree, but first you must understand what it means and why it is seen as meritocratic. Good? Now, Talcott Parsons also says that the education system is functional. Who else said the education system functional? We just do him. Emil Durkheim also said that the education system is functional. Now Talcott Parson is adding his voice. He's saying the education system is functional because it teaches the value of achievement. He said once you come into school, automatically you start learning that if you work hard, you can get what you want. And that is the basis of a modern society. The understanding that if you work hard, you can get what you want. Yeah? So he said the education system is functional because it teaches the students the value of achievement. When you're the home, them don't really teach you that. Them just give you things because you're pretty or you're for them picnic. I remember when my, I had my first child. And at that time, I'm frightened because I want picnic and I think she's so special. Now, I have three minutes to care as much. But when we did just have the first one, and she was in, when she was in grade one, her first semester of grade one, she was doing so well because she was reading so well, far above most of the other children. And so she was always student of the week. You see, by the time she reached semester two, everybody I read and everybody ready. Yeah. And so it is now about writing and how well you write off the board, etc. And she can't write at all. So she stopped being student of the week. There's another girl in our class that was legitimately brighter than her. And I'm going to talk about that. And I'm making that point because there is a full debate about legitimately being brighter than somebody else. But this other girl in her class was doing well and, and always being student of the week. I'm a daughter. She get like a bad mind and like a jealous and she come back and she start ball to me. That time she was six. That, you know, oh, she's never student of the week and whatever. And we feel so sorry for her. Plus we're so frightened for her. So our father got work and he print off a full certificate for her. So she has student of the week. And we do we yard and we have a full ceremony and we give her the student of the week certificate and to take her picture. And she's so happy. And all was going well till she carried her school, go show the teacher. So she has student of the week. And the teacher take it away. The teacher confiscates. She say, you are not student of the week. You can't write. You're not writing good. You're not student of the week. Full stop. Now, at home, there is not, there's no value of achievement being taught. She won't be student of the week, so we we'll make her student of the week because she's special. It's as simple. A few picnics, so she's special. At school, school is like, no, you are not student of the week. You never write good. Everything where you write spell wrong, you're not student of the week because school teaches you the value of achievement. Parsons also says that school teaches the value of equality of opportunity. It is school that first tells you that regardless of who you are, you are able to get it. So everybody have the same chance to win. And he says that is important if we are going to have a stable modern society. So in this way, according to Talcott Parsons, the education system is functional. It is because of these two things, the meritocracy of the system and the functionality of the system, that the education system also fosters social mobility. Now, social mobility is the actual ability to move from one strata of the social ladder, they would say, to another. So you can move from lower class to middle class or from middle class to upper class. 
Talcott Parsons of the belief that the education system, because it allows for equality of opportunity, because it is based on universalistic standards, because there's the value of achievement, then automatically it will allow persons who are talented, persons who work hard to move from lower class to middle class to upper class. It will give them the qualifications necessary to go out and change them social standing. So for Talcott Parsons, the education system is wonderful. It is functional. It is meritocratic. It fosters social mobility. Now remember the functionalists and who they are. They're often said to be utopian because they believe that society is good and all things are great, which is why we end up now with the people who disagree with them, like the Marxists. So let's see what the Marxists have to say. We're now looking at the Marxist view of education. Remember I said it to you before, sociology is always a debate. You have arguments for, you have arguments against. The functionalists have put forward their arguments. They've said to you that the education system is good. It's working. It ensures that society exists and is stable. It is meritocratic. You know, it, is, um, it fosters social mobility. They are saying, I have done the research, and that is what I find out about education systems in modern society. The Marxists and also... It's like when I look for somewhere totally different because that's not how we see the educational system. Now, the Marxists we're going to look at are Samuel Bowles and Herbert Gintis. So many of you believe that the only Marxist is Karl Marx. Mash down that lie. Karl Marx wrote the full, you know, Communist Manifesto. And many persons, as a consequence, follow him and then use his, re, um, his writings as the basis of their theories. But there are other persons who are Marxists, like Samuel Bowles and Herbert Gintis. Now, you know, you must know the names. You cannot do sociology without the names. A sociological essay without names is like a history essay without dates. You're going to get them wrong, you're going to fail. And we don't know failure about here. Good? Samuel Bowes and Herbert Gintis. Bowes and Gintis says the aim of the educational system is to reproduce the capitalist labor force. Simple. He said the educational system is owned by the bourgeois, the upper class. And they who own it, the only reason they have it is to ensure that the lower class people know how to become good capitalist laborers. So when you go to school, all you go to school for do is to learn how to come work for the big man. It's as simple. As simple as that. You go to school just to learn how to come out, come work for the big man so he can exploit you and you can go home with your pittance. He said that is what the education system is there for, to reproduce the capitalist labor force. And it is done via what he calls the hidden curriculum. Key term, write it down. Most company and multiple choice, you must write it in your essay. Key term, hidden curriculum. He says it is the hidden curriculum that helps us, helps the system, sorry, to reproduce the capitalist labor force, to turn you into the sort of laborer that the rich capitalists want you to be, the hidden curriculum. He said when you go to school, you know, you have the written curriculum, that are the syllabus, the the things where them tell us that you're going to learn. But then you have the hidden curriculum. Some things them don't tell you about, but those are the key things where you learn. Say, so I say, yeah, you yeah, learn English, but what are they in between the words? Yeah, you yeah, learn maths, but what are I behind the number? Yeah, you ever hear like, oh, Muta Barukata, I so, say, like, where you really get from it? And so them see it, yeah? So they say, when you look at the hidden curriculum, the first thing the hidden curriculum teach you is subservience and docility. Himself, from your girl's school, you learn to be subservient and docile. You are told from early to do what I say. Simple. And so you will get a math problem. And you will get the math problem right. And you still not get the full marks because them say you never do it the right way. You never follow what the teacher say. You have to be docile and subservient. They say at school, anybody that have independent thought, anybody that do something different is punished. And so they might say, fine X, you know, X plus two equal four, fine X. And there's a young man in put a arrow and say, see X there. Now he might think about it. It's outside of the box thinking. Teacher game rang bang. Go to the back of the class, you're two duns because you think outside of the box. Instead, from you go to school, you learn principles, walking lines to where you're going. Why? 
how that help nobody? Why me can't walk zigzag? Because you have to be docile and subservient. That's the thing that school is teaching you via the hidden curriculum. Then we say the maths and English are even important. What you need to learn is to do what your teacher tell you to do. They say the second thing that the school teaches us via the hidden curriculum is the acceptance of hierarchy. Now, when you go to school, you learn that there are different levels of people above you. You have your little class monitor, then you have your prefect, then you have your teacher, and you have your, you know, HOD, and you have your VP, and you have your principal. And you have to respect every level of them coming up. If you have a problem, you can't just go to your principal. Oh, you, did you speak to your prefect? No, I'm saying that is important, you know, because when you get to work, it's the same hierarchy that is there, and you have to accept the hierarchy. He said the acceptance of hierarchy is very important because it helped them to control the labor force. So when you go to school, your prefect is a student too. But she is empowered, so she starts to feel like she's a teacher. So she helped the teacher now control you, our fellow student, and she feel like she's big. Them said them things are important, you know, because when you go to school, you, you can work, sorry, you have a supervisor. And your supervisor, you know, is just a proletariat like you. He may not get much more than you, but him empowered with the name supervisor, so him feel him little better. So him help the boss now control you. Boss don't know, say so you come in five minutes later now. You know who oh know? Supervisor. Him, uh, where are you coming from? Now supervisor is like you, yeah? But he's empowered, and he learned from school. So with this little power, him look a bit better, and so him help the boss to control and exploit you. From school, you start learn to accept hierarchy so that the exploitation can continue. Him said the next thing that school teaches us via the hidden curriculum is to be motivated by external rewards. Bows and Jinty say when you look on school, school boring. Picnic a light go school. Them said them the light go school because teachers practice what they call the jug mug theory. The teachers are just the persons with the knowledge, they are the jugs, they pour out the knowledge in the head of the students, they are the mugs. So pick me eight school. You don't want to go. There is no real joy in learning, yeah? Because you don't get a chance to express yourself and be yourself. But you go to school the same way. You know why you go every day? Because you want to pass exam, that's an external reward. Because your mother gives you lunch money, that's an external reward. Because you want to see a little boyfriend, that's an external reward. And so you find it is not for the joy of school that you go to school. You go to school for the external reward. You're motivated by external rewards. Now that's important. Because when you get to the work world, remember, you know, they said the aim of school is to reproduce the capitalist labor force, to reproduce the sort of laborers that are easily exploited in the capitalist system. When you got to work, you have to be motivated by the external rewards. Bows and Ginty say work is alienating and it boring. People no want go. Yeah? As them go work on Monday, them I say, Jesus got out on a Friday. Hmm? From then read, then get up in the morning, then can't have a bother go. They was like, Lord, why am I have work today? You say, all Christmas I come? People are counting down from when? For Christmas. Because they don't want to be there. But they go to work same way because they're motivated by the external reward of the pay. It's as simple as that. That is why you have, thank God, it's Friday. Some of you might have done summer work. I remember when I did summer jobs, it's the most boring work in the world. I did summer jobs like at Scotia Bank, and Scotia Bank is to take on whole heap away. And we're glad that no, Scotia Bank feed we, give we money. But when you go work, nothing at all for do. I sit down in one little room by myself, and me I put statements in an envelope for the whole day. I get so bored, I start making them talk to each other. Mr. Brown, me to Miss K. Kiss, kiss. No, no, no. You like each other. I saw me I do for the whole day. Remember a friend of mine, Fabian, and Fabian, the link we up on the work. Fabian didn't, mother didn't know somebody. And Fabian carried going from the work, you know. When you see Fabian I got work, you know, Fabian dapper, you know, because mother dapper foreign, you know, man. Yeah? That time Fabian reached a call box for an early call, we would not reach a work early. When Fabian reached a work, all him had a sharp pencil. For the old day, and you want to see your early reach. Old day, remember one time the pencil them done him call with you, the pencil them done. And so what must do him? Say, yeah, I broke them back next to them thing, I don't do nothing. And I sharpen again. But him go every day. Why? Because he is motivated by external rewards. They say even the persons that you think that they have the best jobs in the world, they don't want to be doing it every day. They don't. Look, like, look at a man like Cartel. 
How did Cartel get in trouble? And you would think that he had the best job in the world. But even being a DG and the man at the top of the world get a little bit boring, so you have to do some extra on the side. That's what they say. And so you find that, especially for the man who do the normal work, he has to be motivated by external rewards. And where that starts? School. So they say the education system, its entire purpose is to actually reproduce the capitalist labor force via the hidden curriculum. And it is the hidden curriculum that actually teach you the key things, not the actual written curriculum, not the syllabus, them they're not important. It is the norms and values that they want you to learn so that when you get out into the work world, you can be the sort of laborer that is easily exploited. Hmm? Him say, if you look at school as well, the hidden curriculum teach you the fragmentation of knowledge. When you go to school, you have some people who do arts, you have some people who do business, you have some people who do science, and when you take a stop, you know, business people not talk to science people because science people go on like them too bright and them know everything. Science people not talk to business people because business people just waste time. Arts people not talk to science people and are so no fragmented. Them said that fragmentation is important because once again, it helps the boss, the school to divide and conquer to easily control you. Them say when it is you go to work is the same God Almighty thing. When you go to work, you have marketing department, you have production department, you have accounts department, and them not deal. Yeah, marketing not like accounts, because accounts no one give no money and I go on like a feed them money when I company money and I let go with them means health. Yeah? Accounts can't take marketing because all marketing I do, I spend half the whole like money and now I do nothing and go out, go drink juice. Production don't like the rest of them because a the production I do all of the work and the rest of them don't care and them I get the money. And so what happens is that if marketing have a problem and want strike, production not join them because they not like them. If accounts have a problem and want strike, marketing not join them because they not like them. And so it is easier for the boss to divide and conquer. This fragmentation starts from where? From school. So Bose and Gintis totally disagree with what the functionalists have said. They see that the education system is not functional for the masses. It only functions for the capitalists by helping to prepare you, the proletariat, to be the sort of laborer that the capitalists can exploit. And what helps to prepare us? The hidden curriculum. Know the term. Know the term. Hmm? Bows and Gintis goes on and they say something also as important. They say the education system is not meritocratic, not fair. Now remember, you know, Talcott Parson just made big chat. Talcott Parson just said to you that education system is meritocratic, it is fair, it operates on universalistic standards. Bows and Gintis say that is rubbish. It is rubbish and then they give the quote to explain why it's rubbish. They say a high IQ is not the cause, but the consequence of long stay in school. And so the system can't be meritocratic. What does that mean? They must say, listen, it is not because you're bright you stay long in school, but because you stay long in school, you get bright. Which means that anybody who can afford to stay longer in school will automatically do better. And those who can't afford to stay long in school, they will automatically fail. And so the system is so designed that the rich will pass and the poor will fail. Bows and Ginty says that there is a myth of meritocracy. They make you think, say, the system fear. As a matter of fact, what them do is that them let through two poor people and make them two poor people go through. And then you know as the next poor one when I go through, I say, well, if him can do it, then me must can do it. The system really fear. But in reality, them creating an illusion. Them let through two and keep through thousands, keep down thousands. And you now see the two and I say, well, if him do it, me suppose he can do it in a me, what this? When in reality, it is the system that is keeping you down. But Sanji said, take it out. If you're not on a book, you can't pass. When GSAT was being done, they say on average the students who go past GSAT, you know, go extra class six out of seven days for the week. So if your mother can't afford extra class, you go school, you can't pass. They say 70% of those who pass CSEC math went to extra class. That means if your mother can't afford extra class, you go fail. Yeah? They say if you look at how people get to school, 
You have some students that them parents drive them to school. I remember I sat down in my friend's car, I always use her as an example, and she have her little video with her son. And in that video, look at CD. And in it, it just say, A is for apple. B is for ball. C is for ca everywhere him driver that him ear. A is for all me start saying, A is for apple. Yeah? That means same up that in them head continuously. Compare it to the next one, we take a bus. And in a film, head in my ear about Dagarin. Who is going to pass? Them say, if you look at these things, who go school hungry versus who go with everything set? Bows and Ginty says that the system is so designed that the poor will fail and the rich will pass. They say it is a part of the entire system now. If you look now, just look at the pandemic. If you don't have a tablet, warm. You don't have constant internet, warm. There are some kids, you know, that online school don't move them, you know, because they already did have them set up space. They already had internet, they already had a table, they already had a chair, they already had somebody there to help them, they already had a tutor. You have some picnic that from online school start them to go to school one time, you know. Their mother don't tell us I want phone and I have no credit, my youth go run up and down. And so now we have to find out what is going to happen to them. Bows and Ginty said that the system was always like that. The system is so designed that the rich will pass and the poor will fail. And the few poor that pass is because the system let them through so that they can create the illusion of meritocracy. So that you can think that it is fair, when in reality, we need everybody to stay poor so that you can work for the big man, the bourgeois. So Bows and Gentis believes that social mobility is not possible, which is unlike what was said by Talcott Parsons. Bows and Ginty said the majority of poor people will live the same lives that their parents lived. It's as simple as that. He said that it's very few change them circumstances. He says that societies will change, but if a society change and get richer, I saw it get richer. So the people at the top stay at the top and them just move the same way. You always have the same people at the bottom. And so there is no social mobility because the system is so designed that you can't afford university. It's as simple as that. When it is that you go up to the university, the fees are prohibitive. You try to get student loan, you hear saying you're not a guarantor. And so you can't get through. So even if you dare try to borrow, forget it, you can't get it. Bows and Gigi said that is how the system is set. So you're seeing now how you can now juxtapose Parsons and Durkheim with Bowles and Gintis. Now, none of them is setting stone where you must say, oh, the one is right and the one is wrong. Yeah? You should, however, be able to appreciate the knowledge that they are trying to pass on. You should understand the points they're trying to make. And then you should be able to criticize all of them. Because Bowles and Gintis are criticized continuously as well. There are many people that argue that they forget the importance of individualism and determination and persons who decide that they're going to do well. The persons who criticize Bows and Gentis say they take it for granted that the failure is the system fault and not the person fault. When in reality, enough of the people that work at school are crosses. And not because they're poor, they fail, and because they're crosses. Because they never intend to do nothing at school. I have had students in my class that don't intend to do no work at all. Just come in and just enjoy an ear. Ear and friend and out a door, that sort of thing. They say persons don't look at that. They say persons don't look at the parents and the role of the parents in the failure of the students. Yeah? So for instance, J.W.B. Douglas says, when that person, sorry, Bows and Gintis were criticizing. Very important, Bows and Gintis. They say you don't look at the importance of the parents. Are the parents sufficiently interested in your education? Is it the school fault or is it the parent fault? When last your mother got PTA and she lived next door to the school. How come you have phone card and phone and you're not in a book? So Bows and Gintis is not necessarily the ones that are correct. You have to know and be able to criticize all. So, very interesting topic today, and that is all. <laughs>